Welcome to Roundtable 4, everyone. Um, and this is looking at um, improving patient outcomes with the latest search for technology. Um, so the focus obviously is on the patient outcomes bit um, and what sort of work is happening um, and what people just need to consider when it comes to mental collaborations within that. I will be asking our panel members um, questions. Um, so if anyone in the audience has got any questions, then please just type them in and I will keep an eye out um, for that. Um, so I shall start off by getting everybody else to introduce themselves, and I'll do that on the order that you appear on my screen. So we'll start off with Omar. Okay, thank you, V, and hello, everyone. So my name is Omar Masood. Uh, I'm a consultant transplant surgeon in Leeds. Um, my, my background is in liver, kidney, and pancreas, but my current role is very much um, on kidney, and I also lead the pediatric renal transplant program for Yorkshire. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in, uh, you know, tech across the board. Um, so yeah, nice to meet you all. Thank you. Um, Richard. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Richard Brady. I'm a consultant colorectal surgeon, uh, with a specialist interest in inflammatory bowel disease. I'm based in Newcastle hospitals, obviously in Newcastle and, um, on the executive of the European society of coloproctology. I'm an ex digital lead for the NIHR in the Northeast and North Cumbria. And we run a couple of events trying to foster innovation called Digital Catalyst, which, for which I was the chair. Uh, I'm, I like to publish in this area, uh, particularly in apps and social media. And I'm really excited to join this group today. It's a really uh, high powered group and I've been really impressed by the conference so far. So thank you for the invite. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Julie. Hi there, everybody. I'm the CEO of Guts UK Charity, and we're the charity for digestive health. We were set up in 1971 by the British Society of Gastroenterology with £500, and they said we need to do some research into the digestive system. 50 years later, yes, we've put in £16 million into research in this area, but as we all know, our digestive system is basically under underfunded, understaffed and misrepresented. I came five years ago in 2016 and, and my background's fundraising. And at that point, the charity was called CORE, C-O-R-E. And nobody knew about it. We changed the name to Guts UK. We're a small team, we went digital. In the last year that we were CORE, we had 34,000 people to the website in a whole year. We now get over 100,000 a month. I make this point because it's really important. And I think, you know, uh, Professor John this morning's talk is about accessibility of this whole subject. So, you know, the name's important and being up there and waving your hands saying, come talk to us. Normally, we would have a lovely blow up colon called Colin. Um, and he's fantastic if we walk through him and we're taking him out to festivals and we start the conversation about our guts. Um, and I linked up with V, it's good four years ago now, isn't it? The first time I came to one of your sessions in Leeds. And we're based in, we've got an office in Huddersfield just down the road. So the whole Northern thing is really, really important. Um, and we would have had Colin the Cole on there for you all to meet this year had it been in, in, in real life. Um, but I'm delighted to be here because it is really, really important that patients understand and see the hope of everything everything that you are all doing. That's what they need and they need access to it. So thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Julie um, and Ryan. Hi, morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ryan Matthew. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon at Leeds. Uh, also uh, an associate professor at the University of uh, Leeds. And um, sorry, I'm really struggling to hear. There's a lot of crackling. Um, um, and uh, I'm also the neurosurgery lead for the NIHR MIC and the academic lead for the Centre for Immersive Technologies at Leeds. Um, so very well linked in with uh, medtech. My research passion is really in brain tumours and I'm going to completely disagree with my learned colleague Julie because brain cancer is the most underfunded cancer and, and research of unmet need really and um, I'm desperate for uh, our patients to have better outcomes, more research funded and medical technologies as a potential solution for that. Okay, thank you. So we've got another speaker who's, uh, who will join us in a minute um, once they work out um, the technical bits on their end. Um, but I think of the, of the audience, um, I'll just sort of set the context for the discussions, you know, so 
you know, for us, MedCheck innovation really should be about providing care that is safe, you know, care that is reliable and care that is clinically effective. And that is what the MedTech collaborations are really seeking to, um, to demonstrate. Um, you know, so what we need for any innovations that come through is they need to significantly improve patient outcomes, you know, by, by one of many ways. So either preventing premature death, enhancing quality of life for those with chronic or long-term conditions, helping patients recover following injury, and also protecting patients from avoidable harm. So for this round table session, um, I've just divided the, um, uh, this area into three main bits, and we're going to start off with understanding what the unmet needs are. Because one of the challenges that we find as a surgical MIC is we get um, a lot of offers for innovations coming through, um, but not all of them actually um, meet an unmet need, or some companies or some innovators really don't quite understand actually how do you meet the needs of the NHS. So if I can start off with you, Omar, you know, can you tell us about some of the challenges that um, needs patients face, especially in the field of organ transplantation? Thank you, B. Um, I guess, you know, the most important thing is, is, is the background to this. The biggest challenge faced by transplantation as a whole is um, the disparity between the number of patients waiting for organs and the number of transplants that we're able to do. And just to get an idea about that, um, you know, the current number of patients waiting is in the region of about six to seven thousand. And over the last five years, that's come down from about 10,000. We are managing to do in the region of 5,000 transplants a year, but that shortfall still has a significant impact on, on a large number of lives. Where waiting on the waiting list, um, you know, uh, correlates with um, increased mortality, increased morbidity, essentially um, death on the waiting list. So, you know, the, the onus is very much on transplanting more and for organs to last longer. And so with inside of that group, where, where particularly the, the needs are from a uh, service development is for us to kind of improve access. So we are accessing more donors, could be from, you know, um, in, uh, innovations to improve donor optimization, to recruit donors that normally previously would have been excluded as well as as far as sort of raising awareness about organ donation as a whole. With inside of the issues with the recipient challenges, um, clearly there's an onus on getting it right first time. Um, and you know, the, the ways that can be done is about optimizing organs as much as possible. So tech that we particularly use in Leeds is using various perfusion machines to try and um, you know, improve uh, our monitoring of graphs, um, as well as you know, um, being able to uh, use graphs that we normally would have not used in the past. Um, alongside that is the developments within the pharmaceutical industry and, and immunosuppression. So immunosuppression has become a lot more sophisticated um, and there are biological variants of immunosuppression to try to kind of tailor um, the needs of the recipients that allows organs to last longer, but it also allows us to transplant people who may not be so well immunologically matched. Um, and that then kind of comes on to the area where I'm particularly interested in, and, and that's to try and improve our, um, you know, techniques and developments in organs as a whole. So, for example, in one of them, in pancreas transplant, which has evolved through solid organ pancreas transplant through to islet cell transplant, and then moving in towards the area that I'm working on now, which is the engineered micropancreas. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But essentially, the, 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 the kind of take home message is, is that we need to be getting more organs for transplant and we need the organs to be lasting longer and this directly has an impact of reducing death on the waiting list yeah thank you um thank you for that um so if we just uh move on to ryan um you know you you're obviously very much interested in developing new ways of detecting and identifying tumors um and you do a lot of work in terms of evaluating um, new um, intraoperative treatments why is this important um to patients that are undergoing neurosurgery yeah, so I, I'd really like to look at technology in terms of the whole patient's pathway from the moment they come to clinic. So patients walk in through the door, lay people, and they're expected to understand extremely complex aspects of their disease, such as how their tumour relates to important, eloquent areas of their brain. And that's a real challenge for patients. It's a real challenge for our trainees, never mind the patients that come through the door. We then have preoperative considerations, so better visualization of the pathology and the important structures that are often millimeters away. And this is all aimed at making surgery safer, but obviously maximizing the possibility of a, of a resection. But this also extends to other aspects of neurosurgery, so vascular neurosurgery, where the 
the morphology of the aneurysm is is fundamental to the um, outcomes as well. We then move intraoperatively, and one of the major challenges we have in brain cancer is that the tumor is intermingled with normal brain and healthy brain. And unlike other organs, we can't just cut out extra bits. We can't take the whole organ away or take a big margin. So it's about how do we use new technologies such as nanoparticles, fluorescence, uh, intraoperative laser technologies, uh, perhaps immersive technologies, which I'll talk about a bit later, to identify the residual tumor that's left and target it selectively and effectively. This also has a translational element. So I, I co-run a lab group where we look at ACE early in basic translational research. So organ on a chip, organoid technologies, in vitro clinical trials. These are all also fundamental technologies that we need to bridge that gap between the, uh, the labs and our uh, translational outcomes. And then, of course, imaging at, at the end. You know, how do, how do we image patients, monitor them? How can we use machine learning and AI to detect early recurrence um, and also the progression of uh, tumours through imaging as well? So we're doing a lot of work around that. And again, I'll, I'll talk to you. So, so we really have clinical needs that are very much unmet in this population. Um, right from the moment they walk through the clinic through to the point where they are having their operation and then being monitored uh, thereafter again. And, and I think we can really make strides in improving outcomes and making that journey better for our patients. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. And I think you sort of raise an important point in terms of, you know, we expect um, patients to understand all these technologies and all the terminology and things. Um, you know, so, you know, if I move it to, to Richard, you know, so you're obviously your colorectal surgeon, um, and together that Susan is, is just joined. Um, you know, so from the perspective of actually patients needing to understand, you know, what's happening to them, um, and um, sort of the, un the unmet needs around, um, you know, patient outcomes, you know, what do you think, you know, the unmet needs are from a patient outcome perspective, you know, or quality of life perspective? What, what are we missing? Where are we not joining the dots? Yeah, so um, I, I'll start off if that's okay, Susan. I think Susan's just getting set up. Um, but I think there that's a big question. Uh, outcomes, unmet needs, and quality of life, all big issues for modern healthcare to try and address. In terms of outcomes, uh, we're trying to connect our health system in order to measure this appropriately and, and have interoperability between the various uh, systems that we use within the NHS. Uh, so your radiology department, your biochemistry, your uh, clinic letters. Now, as part of the Great North Care Record, is a really exciting time, especially in the Northeast and North Cumbria. So I would say that as future, as we progress into the future, more integration of actually our records would be useful in order to measure outcomes across the country, but also across your life. So that from birth, from cradle to, to death or cradle to grave, you have an entire record of your care uh, along that time. What is important in terms of the unmet needs, and if you you know what is an unmet need, you haven't ac can't access care or you're not getting great care in in that way, and the things that challenge that mostly in the north of England are distance, uh, education of the patient, whether they're able to understand and interact with the kind of material that we provide to them, uh, uh, and also uh, their affordability, which is a real issue. You know, can they afford to come to hospital to sit in a car park and pay the fees? So, I mean, the, the thing that has really transformed in the last year during pandemic is this uh, pressure to try and reduce people coming to hospital. And that's actually led to a lot of rapid innovation, which has been, if you can have an outcome, which is good in the pandemic, that has been it. Uh, so I banged my head against the wall for about a year to try and get teleclinics in place. But not, uh, and I run an IBD clinic, so I have patients traveling 100 miles with colitis across the country to come and see me in a clinic for really no great reason, apart from the infrastructure was there to sustain. That was the only way that they could access the care that they needed. So with the introduction of video consultations and, and uh, teleclinics, there's been a real ability to decrease uh, the number of unmet needs because people, you know, people really struggle to access good care uh, local to them whilst they've got children to look after they have to go to work they can't afford to travel or it's too painful for them to travel uh, this is all about addressing unmet needs with technology 
In the future, I think follow up, a lot of follow up from uh, what we do can be done by technology and wearables and the ability to feedback via mobile phones about their progress to interact via uh, pictures and other ways is a way of reducing the burden of people having to access the touch points of the NHS coming into clinic or coming into their GP or, or their practice nurse or community nurses. A lot of this can be done by by supplying a, a wraparound service, uh, which may be able to look after them by tele access. And in terms of quality of life, I think we do this very badly. Uh, I think that we don't really, firstly, know what the best tools are. Uh, the traditional quality of life measures that we use for a commission doesn't really, uh, you know, if I have patients who have problems with stomas, uh, the quality of life 5D doesn't, doesn't approach anywhere near the problems and issues that they have with their life. So and they are the, the calculations that commissioners use in order to decide whether to invest in certain technologies within their remit. I also think that, you know, with we often measure quality life of life at one time point, but with technology, we can have an ongoing measurement of quality of time points and then detect whether we're actually getting this right. Is it right that patients come back four to six weeks after their operation for a review, or would that be best delayed to eight to 10 weeks? Uh, we don't know that data because we don't do this on a long-term uh, basis in, a, in enough numbers to have insight. And technology and the use of mobile phones, regular ability to link in and, and for patients to provide feedback is a way of doing that. And the final thing is sometimes we measure the wrong thing. A successful surgery may be devastating for the patient. And it's really, the issue is that we need to understand what patient uh, reported outcome measures are important to patients. Uh, and in terms of quality of life, I still don't think we've got this right across the, pl across the plane in surgery, but particularly in quality of life surgery, where there are the intimate issues, where there are uh, confidence issues, uh, and where there are issues about getting back to an, a quality of life, not just functionally, but emotionally. Um, uh, I see Susan still hasn't joined, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll give the question back to you, to you, V, if that's all right. Okay, yeah, no, th no, thank you, Richard. And I think you raise um, very important points in terms of how we're actually measuring the right things. Um, and I mean, I guess it's one of the reasons why for the NIHR, the patient and public involvement is actually very important is, um, you know, we need to include the patients and, you know, lay members in actually the, some of the decision-making processes and actually understanding what is happening throughout that. Um, because, you know, we come across loads of innovations where, you know, it's brilliant for the surgeon, but actually it might not be so brilliant for the patient. Um, and I think people often tend to forget these real people at the end of, you know, a technology piece that, that people are using. You know, so, um, so in terms of looking at it now from the patient side, um, you know, Julie, I'll come to you. Um, you and your organization, Guts, you know, UK powerful advocates, you know, for improving outcomes um, for patients' digestive disorders. You know, what, what are your thoughts on how well medtech innovations address these outcomes? You know, what are the gaps where the improvements, you know, required? Yeah, I think Richard's put it beautifully there about that, you know, always having the real life experience of the patient involved. You know, there's an idea, but actually does it work and does it work for everyone? And we all know that variation of care throughout the UK is a key thing. You know, it's, it, you know, somebody can... One hospital can have a brilliant MDT set up and another one doesn't, you know, and so it, that's really important. I think Richard's done that. Um, I, I possibly want to come back to um, the link with Ryan and what he mentioned. Uh, Gut UK Charity is a founding member of the Less Survivable Cancers Task Force. And this was bringing six separate charities together um, to address the fact that 51% of cancer deaths are of six cancers. And apart from brain and lung, the other four are all digestive, esophageal, stomach, pancreatic, and liver. And we came together as patient organizations to, to talk about what we have in similarities. And it's been a really powerful voice that has got us into uh, Scottish Parliament to talk with a member of Parliament for, for Health and the Cancer Recovery Task Force. And, and one example of, of medical intervention, so the cyta sponge. So if we go back to our, if we go to back to my course, Got to UK, you know, we know that people wait six to 18 months to go and get any kind of first contact even going to see the gp if something's going wrong in their gut and that's that fear of an endoscope isn't it it's a fear of a scope up or down so presentation 
by the patient is always an issue for us. Um, and therefore, you know, with cytosponge and esophageal cancer, we've invested in breath tests and saliva tests. You know, we need earlier diagnosis because it's got terrible outcomes. And cytosponge um, had its first clinical G uh, trial with GPs that ended in August 2020. And the very next month, the Scottish Parliament decided that rather than wait four years to gather more data, they used it to um, in improve the backlog, to start to improve the backlog of of um endoscopies that needed for upper gi they they said we'll gather the data as we go so in my time frame i've seen brilliant innovations that are brought in you know being used quickly and come up the agenda quicker so you know i'm i'm you know it's more about people understanding it isn't it and accessibility and telling stories and patients connecting and we all know that the patient perspective has to be right at the beginning so when we've done research priority setting partnerships where you do bring everybody together patients carers scientists researchers clinicians doctors nurses everybody and you start talking um you see and i've witnessed the perspective change when a patient is brave enough to put their hand up and go I don't care if you did develop that. I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't let you use it on me. And the side of the room goes silent, and I can see the shoulders of the, everybody going down. But you've got to listen to that because if you if you then can't get them into the clinical trial, you know we're, we're wasting years, years. So you you know I know you've got brilliant ideas, but if you don't have those patients in the room, PPIE is complicated. We don't need the professional patient who's there for everything and turns up and can only talk about their their illness. We have to have the scope of people, and we have to empower them to be brave enough to stand in that room and say what they feel. Yeah, so they do talk about the car parking costs. You're right, Ryan. My God, the, the whole issue of can you afford to go to hospital. You know, yes, we've got to address that. And this this double space has done that now. But let's empower people in the room to say, if you're going to broddle my pancreas, my painful pancreas that debilitates me, I want to understand why you're doing this and what the outcomes are. So right from the beginning, they need to be in there. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, Julie, I think that's absolutely right. It's, um, you know, it's the importance. Um, you know, there's some people who get it, um, you know, but we're still working with some companies who actually weren't even aware they could have um, patient and public involvement or you could actually ask patients questions about what they need to do. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, so, uh, Susan, yes? Yeah, um, I hope you can hear me okay, sorry. It's yeah. embarrassing to have technical difficulties in a med tech. Apologies. Um, I think I think Julie's point is absolutely valid, and I'm just thinking: Do you think if we'd done PPI or patient-related outcome measures, things like colonoscopies would ever have got started? Who would ever, as a patient, <laughs> agree to a colonoscopy? I don't know if that's just my personal preference because colon capsules. Absolutely. Yeah, colon capsules coming out, and I know it's not perfect; it has limitations, but it's very attractive. I'm not sure I would agree to a school provide a colon capsule. Absolutely, Susan. And if and don't forget, you go into that room as a patient. If you're just getting called for your regular, you know, 55, 60 plus job, it's already nerve wracking, isn't it? But if you if you're going into that room and it's all comfortable and delivered well, it's quite fascinating. But if you're going into that room with a problem and it could be, you know, you're in a very different mindset. You're dead right. But the fact that people, you know, for our digestive cancers that they don't present because of the fear of it, got to do more on that. That's early. That's the key. That's a key. Doesn't matter what you know, med tech designs and innovations you come up with. If they're not even presenting till stage four, it's not going to work, is it? So we've really got to have the patient in at the beginning of everything, and we've got to, you know, as I say, standing there with my inflatable collar in the colon at the Peace Hall in Halifax, and people coming up going, "Is that what I think it is?" And I go, "Come in. It's fascinating. It's beautiful." You have a really good conversation about polyps. Yeah. And I've had I've had a couple arguing at the best. The best story is a grandma and a grandpa are arguing. They got the kids through and the kids were punching it and all the rest of it. And eventually she took the granddad wouldn't go through. When they came out the other end, she said, good. She is going to resend for that test now because he threw it in the bin and said, nobody's going to. I'm not doing that. She said, now you know, we've explained it. He's going back. Come on. You know, we've got to do more yeah, of that. Which is a, which is a brilliant outcome. Um, you know, so in terms of, um, yeah, and Richard said he's really disappointed. Yeah, we are disappointed as well. We're having a colon, a colon here. Yeah. Um, but let's move on to some of the new innovations that are coming up in this space. I'll start with you, Ryan. Um, 
you know, you've got a huge interest in immersive technologies. You know, can you tell us a bit more about what's on the horizon um, and the possibilities for patient care? Yeah, so I mean, we're really excited about immersive technologies, um, but I think what uh, John Took said is very important with any technology, and, in, and probably mostly so in something like immersive. And I know that we tell people, immersive is this very cool, very exciting technology, but it, we've got to remember it's only worthwhile if it helps patients. You know, I, can't, I, don't, I don't, I'm not a subscriber at all to technology that's cool for the sake of being cool because there's plenty of things we can buy as gadgets in the house and so on like that. We've got to have this focus on, can it be implemented? Is it feasible? And can it impact patient care? If it doesn't tick those boxes, it doesn't really matter how shiny that technology is. It's not something that we should be spending time on researching or spending money on in the NHS with, with public funds. So with that in mind, all of our work around immersive technology has a very lo-fi approach with a very cool technology. So one of the projects we're looking at is feasibility and implementation. And I wanted to pick up a little bit on the question that Rachel's asked in, in the chat about how do we maintain this trajectory? And part of it is understanding the lessons around implementation frameworks, barriers to implementation and and enablers so how do we bring these amazing expensive headsets onto a ward you know where actually the reality of all of us that work in healthcare are it's messy it's dirty we've got to make sure that the batteries run out it could be stolen you know where's it going how do you know what happens when a piece breaks off and it's translating all of those things research environment where everything's very clean and very organized into these approaches so that's that's it's a slight fine point but i think it's really fundamental when people talk about something as disruptive as immersive technologies if you don't look at the uncool basic side of things which is which is that so I, we have a whole project on that but going on to what's exciting about it well patient education so one of the things we're looking at is um patient and doctors both wearing immersive technology together and seeing these structures projected in front of us so that we can actually get a three-dimensional concept of where their tumour might be and how that's important um, because we know that 3D visualisation helps patients um, in, in education information. Neuro rehab, many of our patients sit after a head injury in a bed. They're, they're not safe to be on their own and we have a massive resource issue with therapy. So, so they may only get one hour of therapy a day when they spend 12 hours of time in bed. So we're looking at using immersive technologies to augment their environment, which we know stimulates new connections and pathways in their brain, helps their cognitive rehab, but also allows them to do things like reach for a cup of tea that isn't really there. You know, they can't be left with a hot drink because fundamentally that's unsafe. So that's a really cool, simple, intervention that may have um, real therapeutic benefit. And then the other sort of surgical facing things are um, intraoperative navigation using immersive technology and um, MDT working. So the idea that many people could remotely sit and um, call in expertise or provide expertise uh, using avatars and, and immersive technology. And the last thing I want to say about immersive technology is really about um, situational awareness and human factors. So things go wrong in medicine, and in neurosurgery, when they go wrong, they can have really catastrophic effects. And this is pan healthcare, really, is how do you recapitulate some of those rare events in a safe environment where people can just play that situation out over and over again. And I had a trainee recently, we had massive bleeding from the brain, the patient was fine, but the trainee turned around to me and said, I, I wish we could rehearse that or i wish we could sort of do that in an environment where i can just keep playing with that rather than the first time it's happening being in real life and i think immersive technology gives us a real opportunity to do that thank, thank you ryan um and if we move to omar um you know so we've you know you're part of a, a collaboration we facilitated um you know for you um working on a bio artificial you know would you like to tell us a bit more about how that that is and how that would actually improve patient outcomes. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, I, I'm sorry if my sound isn't great. There's been a lot of um, kind of distortion to it. But uh, um, so 
essentially, again, the background to this is, is that um, there's a collaboration um, by the surgical mic and the NIHR to bring us in links with an Israeli biotech company who um, have a particular product that, that is very novel, the way to modality in type 1 diabetes. So um, what we're particularly excited about is, and, you know, type 1 diabetes or diabetes as a whole, um, you know, has very limited with regards to definitive treatment options, but has quite wide ranging impact on mortality and mobility across the field. And, you know, there's something like 4 million people with type 1 diabetes. Currently, definitive treatment is solid organ pancreas transplant or isolated pilot cell cell. Collectively, that offers less than 0.1% of that entire diabetes population the access um, to that treatment. And that's mainly because it's, it's, it's very highly selective because of the high risk associated with the procedure, but also because um, they from the solid organ pancreas transplant, no other treatment option has definitively given insulin. So at best, we've been looking at trying to improve the disease. Now, the novel aspect of this new collaboration is essentially a decellularized protein structure from the pig lung as um, a, a scaffolding to which isolated islet cells can be mounted to, and then that gives a, a degree of stability and allows um, these to be then be vascularized in the body. And so essentially that creates, uh, the combination of the two creates what we call the engineered micropancreas, which, which is in effect a tiny disc. And according to the dose requirement, these can be implanted in different sites in the body. So we're looking at implanting this in the abdominal trunk, a procedure that will ultimately be, can be done in the local anesthetic and wouldn't require a transplant specialist to do it. What the benefit of this is in the animal model work, um, this has shown great results and shown that it has achieved insulin independence um, in diabetic animals. Also, um, what was very interesting is, is that no immunosuppression was used in the animal models. Animal models have a, have a shorter surveillance time than we would do in um, you know, the trials in humans. But we've now moved towards a stage where we are at the discussions with the PPI groups and the HDA groups and looking towards launching trial um, and, and and I echo a lot of the sense of things that you know our engagement with with you know the patient groups and the representative groups has highlighted many things for us um, but essentially this is is this is the kind of progression from solid organ pancreas transplant to islet therapy in uh, what we feel is a more robust package and can have the potential to be offered to patients across the group irrelevant of age comorbidity and, you know, it's a very exciting project, really. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, and for those who are wondering what that project is, we will release details in, in, in next time. Um, but there have been press releases from the companies we will um, talk about that should be on our, on our website. So, just so finding Richard and, and Stephen, because you both cover colorectal, you know, what are the up and coming innovations in technologies um, on, on your on your front? You know, what, what is it that people need to know about? You know, what 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 are the things that are going to shake up that area um, for patients? Do you want to go ahead or I'll I'll go ahead and she stood with her feet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> stage fright. Um, yeah. If Susan heard me say that, she'd, she'd kill me. Uh, she, she doesn't get the stage fright. Um, so, well, uh, let me talk about an IBD. Yeah, even though I can hear you, even though I can't talk to <laughs> I can hear yes. every word. I know where you live, kind of thing. Um, so, do, you want, uh, do you want me to go, Richard? Yeah, crack on, Susan. You, you go first. Okay. Um, I was going to have sympathies with Ryan's comments about implementation and implementation science, because I think that's unique or not unique to neurosurgery. I think that's just generally a medical type thing that um, I certainly don't understand how you get behavioural change and implementation of something that clearly works and clearly patients like. There's still a stumbling block there, isn't there? And not even just the practical aspects or the feasible aspects of the kit itself or the tech of itself. It's the actually getting the doctors to do it, do it. And Richard and I, I'm sure, have lots of examples where something clearly should be done or shouldn't be done in colorectal, but it's still done in some circumstances. I think we all accept we do that. Um, in relation to uh, some colorectal tech, and leads have been very good to me um, through the years when you were in HTC. 
um, and you introduced me to Strathclyde University. So with collaborations with them, we're looking at various things like the liquid biopsy using infrared spectroscopy. So that might be quite patient happy if we can try and diagnose not only cancer, but the age of cancer and the type of cancer from a liquid biopsy. The other thing is microbubbles, using them both as a staging strategy for rectal and colon cancers, but also embedding treatments or thera uh, therapy into them. And again, that's all through contacts that V and HTC and Leeds, as it was then, put me in touch with. And I guess the last thing that Richard touched on earlier was big data linkage. I think no matter what we do, we have to link data clearly, either patients submitting it, us getting it from e-records already there, because it gives a lot of really quick, powerful answers. And I think, although it's not tech, if you look at the results of COVID surge, during COVID, the amount of data collected really quickly and turned around with quick answers that have probably influenced patient and doctor's practice. I think I think that's your evidence of what big data can do. Yeah, well, I think um, moving on from uh, the technologies that Susan has mentioned, in IBD, there's really a revolution under, underway. Uh, the first is that we are designing ways of doing research which decrease the speed of discovery. So you've got things like organoids or high throughput culturing, which are transforming uh, the way that we test uh, new drugs uh, and how we find new immunosuppressants. Uh, we're using uh, elements of big data uh, with machine learning and AI to link massive uh, uh, areas of data together, such as lifestyle data, clinical records, genetic data, and the, the medication data. So it's a, it's a real interesting way in which we're combining a kind of three, a web 3.0 approach, which is physical, biological, and uh, uh, technological approach to research, which is starting to detect those patterns which couldn't be detected before by looking uh, in uh, sort of univision at any one particular variable. Within the patient uh, environment, I think uh, Ryan touched on the fact that we really need to improve the experience of patients. We don't supply them with good quality information or video or animation. Uh, and I think uh, the ability to do that in an interactive way, uh, taking people through their entire inpatient stay by interaction uh, or immersive technology is, is actually really valuable. It, re it reduces anxiety, it, it builds relationships and it allows patients to un undergo their treatment in a calm way. An expected way, and I think um, as Susan's talked about the uh, massive uh, developments in technology and colonoscopy, which is probably going to be put in a museum one day, and we'll look back as she says at the sort of medieval torture device that we put people through. And those developments, you know, especially at the top end of Scotland, uh, Angus Watson running out the uh, the colonoscopy cam capsule. These are going to be transformation, transformative in terms of rapid numbers of patients, uh, large numbers of patients done rapidly in order to screen and exclude disease. So uh, they, they are really exciting. Within the surgery of IBD, uh, I, I call it the sort of social media era of surgery in IBD. I'm a bit of a social media person. But um, within that, I mean that we're connecting people who aren't in the operating theatre. So uh, with technologies like Proximy, you've got a direct connection with somebody else who is uh, educating you and mentoring you through the operation, through a headset or an earpiece. CSATs is another technology in which we can send our videos away to a panel of experts who are live online and can give us critique at the time. And each robot that sits in the corner of any operating theater is connected to every other uh, robot in the planet by the internet because they're all live. Uh, and they they are uh, obtaining huge amounts of interoperative data about how we move our hands and what we're seeing on the screen and the structures to avoid. And they're all, all being analyzed uh, centrally by machine learning uh, and AI. I think uh, personally, one of the researchers that I'm, I'm most I'm excited about because we'll be involved in leading that in the UK is uh, some of the wearable technology in association with uh, STOMA. Uh, so uh, there are now new STOMA devices which will tell people when they are leaking or, or whether they're overfilling the bag uh, and they are giving constant feedback to the patient but also that there is that wraparound telemedicine or telecare possibility whereby we can take the burden off the NHS in terms of uh, overworked stoma nurses and provide a telemedicine solution. So I think that's really exciting, especially from my field. We, we do quite a lot of stomas within IBD surgery uh, and it can, when it goes wrong, it can really destroy lives. So I think it's also a life saving procedure, but we're now going to put in place a technological solution which will assist that uh, uh, satisfactorily. 
Um, not to talk on too much more, but there are other technologies like you know new wear, new polymers that we can inject into fistulas and three D printing to look at fistula tracts, which are complex. And I think uh, we're really embarking on a really interesting era. And as Ryan says, we really got to get this right. Uh, we can't just uh, invest in the bright shiny things. The new technologies that will be successful are those technologies that after a week people will look back on and say, why do we not do this all the time? And uh, they're, they're the things that just feel right, and they may not be the ones that come with the best advertisement, but they're certainly the ones that are the, the, the ones that last the, the journey. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. So unfortunately, we've run run out of time now. It's time for the second, um, second round of um, round table to start. But I'd like to thank you all for your input. Um, and, um, you know, I think there's a lot of take home messages from that. Um, if there's anything else that you think people need to know, or you want to direct them, do what Ryan's been doing and posting in the chat um, details when he'll be posting out um, uh, results of papers and things like that. Um, but I'd like to thank you once again for your time um, and for your input. Um, and if anything, I think most people have definitely learned that we need to put the patient at the forefront of all those innovations and not worry about how shiny it looks, um, you know, or how fancy it is. It's got to be about the patient first and foremost. Um, so thank you all. Um, and everybody else that's watching, um, you can now join the next uh, round table session. Um, so you can go to sessions on the left hand side of the screen. And then you can choose which one the profession you'd like to go to. So thank you once again. Right there.